Hey everybody, it's Adam from Crazy Good Fishing. We're here on Pelican Lake today with my friend Dale Luganbill. Dale is not only an avid outdoorsman and extreme bass fisherman, he also is the, what do you call yourself, podcast yeah, host, narrator? Host host, host. 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 Of the uh, Full Scale Outdoors podcast. So uh, Dale comes up here at Pelican Lake a lot. I don't want to put words in his mouth, <laughs> but he has told me off the record that Pelican's one of his favorite places to fish. And uh, Okay, today he's going to say number one because we're on camera here. But uh, <laughs> we'll talk a little bit while we're out there. We're going to be bass fishing today on Pelican Lake. Now Dale, here in the summertime, you know, we have people coming in. And they always think that spring fishing is fantastic, fall fishing is fantastic, but they get this idea that you can't catch fish in the summer. Yeah, there's all sorts of rumors about that from um, the fish lose their teeth and they have sore mouths, which is not true. That's just a wives' tale. Honestly, uh, fishing can get tough in the summertime. One, abnormally warm temperatures can affect fishing. That's a real thing. But the thing that I think people struggle with the most is that this is the time of year there's more real food for fish than at any other time of the year. All the bait fish have spawned out. All the panfish have spawned out. There's little tiny bluegills, perch, crappies, you name it. The minnows are out. The leeches are going. The crayfish are going up, up here in the And northern. the weeds. Lots and, of cover. And lots of cover. They can hide wherever they want. They're hard. They can be hard to get to. Um, the crayfish do a molt in midsummer. We're not at that pattern yet. Um, and so they'll key in on the bass for sure. Well, everything on this lake eats crayfish. Down to I've cleaned crappies with small crayfish in their belly. Like crayfish is keying on this lake. So but you're saying they are still eating during the summertime? They're eating more now than they do at any other time of the year. So in theory, if they're still eating, but if you had a plastic pizza and a real pizza, okay. which one are you going for? <laughs> I would eat the real. You're pizza. going for the real pizza. That's what. So now you have to really trick these fish into biting something they don't want to eat. Okay, but they will bite if they done hundred percent will bite, and we will show you in a little bit uh, some tricks to kind of help what you, how you can refine. You know, let's find them, but then how to actually catch them once you find them. Sweet, I'm stoked. Let's yeah, go fishing. Let's do it. All right, so we're gonna be throwing jigs. Most bass fishermen are gonna know what a jig is, but if you're new, I'm gonna explain. And there's different head styles, and they all serve a very specific purpose. If you're gonna, where we're at right now, we have some weeds, some reeds, there's weeds out in front of it. So your jig head's gonna wanna be more slender and pointed. And that's what I didn't grab, but. So like a swim jig is one that you throw out and you just reel back. It's very pointed and it's meant to go through these reeds and not hang up on anything. If you're fishing rocks though, you're not gonna want that because that arrowhead's gonna find itself in every crevice and crack and if you're gonna snag it, you're gonna lose the jig. So look at the jig head size. So for rocks, you want what's called a football head, right? That big wide thing is gonna keep it from getting in rocks some. <laughs> Better than the others. You're still gonna, unfortunately bass love cover. And, you know, especially your smallmouth, the craggier the rocks, the better, makes it hard to fish, but that's where the fish are gonna be. So you're just eliminating some of that. Then you have a modified head. This is what I like to use. This is a, this is a juice jig by Outcast Tackle. So it kind of has a little narrow front, but then it wings out on the side. So you have a little football edge there. So you're gonna get a little, you're gonna snag a little more with this than you will with this. But what this gives you is if you're in weeds and rocks, kind of gives you the best of both worlds. And that's gonna come into play uh, because one thing you're gonna wanna look for is weeds and rocks and wood. Those three things, that's the holy trinity of bass fishing. You find those three things, there are gonna be fish living there. It's just a matter of getting them out. And you know, Dale, that's it. funny. So I'm always telling people that. They come and they ask me about, you know, do I wanna be on the rock pile or do I wanna be on the weed line? I tell them no. Find the rock pile on the edge of the weed line where that works. And if you got a stump sticking up, perfecto. So bass are ambush predators. They're gonna hide in something and then wait for something to come in front of them. Then they're gonna dart out and eat it. That's not a fast and hard rule. You're gonna see, sometimes you're gonna see a, a fish just roaming, especially through reeds like that, and they're actively hunting. But more times than not, and pretty much 100% of the time, if the sun's shining bright, they're gonna seek some sort of shade, and they're gonna use that shade to their advantage. They're, they're in the shade, their prey is not in the shade, they don't know they're there, they run out, wham, grab them, right back under the tree, they go chill out and digest. So we're gonna use that against them to kind of crack this nut. So for 
we're imitating, basically what we're imitating here is a crayfish in some way, shape, or form. So we're gonna throw a trailer on here. This is a D-bomb. You can use anything. Uh, I know Strike King makes good ones. You can get hand pours. There's a million of them out there. Find one that looks good to you. I like the, I'm a natural colors guy. Some people like really bright colors. Blue, black, you hear a lot of bass guys. I like stuff that looks like a crayfish. So that, that pumpkin, green pumpkin. Can't go wrong with green pumpkin. I'm just gonna take it, thread it on. About middle way through that body, pull it up. There's a little barb on this shank here. You're gonna push it up to that and then you're ready to go. And this fresh guard's what's gonna keep you from catching every single one of those reeds. It's gonna let you walk up and over logs and I will show you that later. The only thing with it is when it comes time to set the hook, you're gonna have to give it that old build dance like you're trying to move the earth itself because you have to push this down to expose that hook. Now, this is what I use on a bait cast setup. I'm more accurate in casting this. This has a faster gear ratio than a spin casting rod. I can really get those fish out of cover really fast before they wrap you up into the reeds, into a dock, into trees or whatever. So, but if you don't know how to cast a bait caster, you can do the same thing with a spinning rod setup. Now, generally speaking, you'll kind of downsize a little bit, but this is a pretty heavy rod, so it's gonna be able to handle a 3 8 ounce jig just fine. But what you can do is kind of downsize to what's kind of called a Ned rig, um, which is basically just a small flat headed jig. All right, this thing's gonna kind of stand up that and the tails of that crayfish thing. It's got a little brush guard here, weed guard. And so you can throw this on a much lighter setup and get yourself something that looks like a crayfish, like that. This is a Z-Man, these are awesome because <laughs> they don't break. They'll last forever. And it's basically the same, it's exactly the same theory. You're just gonna throw that on there. Put it on. There you go, got a little tiny crayfish. You'll catch everything from rock bass to probably bluegills on this thing, but big bass too. Don't let the little bait fool you. Big bass are still gonna eat this. Cool, let's see what we can catch. Let's do it. I can't catch one off this tree. I don't even want to say because then you know what will <laughs> Most of your bites with this are going to come on that drop. That's why so once your lure hits the water, you're watching your line and you're really paying attention. That's when something's going to happen. Look at that, you called it. Has to be one on the tree. <laughs> oh, I'm here, Bubba. Looks like a largemouth. Yes, sir. Here we go. It's like that. Sweet. Healthy looking fish. Yes, sir. Accuracy is definitely tethered to your success rate. I'm always trying to tell Brock that. Well, the closer you can get to that cover where the fish are hiding without getting into the cover. I mean, sometimes they'll, if they're really aggressive, you could be, I don't know, eight feet away from that and they, he's, they see that splash and they'll run out and get it. But a lot of times they're just hovering right there. Like I said, every tree is going to have one. Come on, big boy. Pro bass flip. That belly. Eating good. Yeah, healthy lake. That's all I tell you. Grows them big. Love it. This is a good example, too. A lot of times, overhanging trees may not even be in the water but they're just but still kind of creating that canopy and giving them especially on a sunny day shade 
but cover. I want to stick that jig under there. You'll have days, some of these trees, it's not a giant tree, but that tree, I've seen trees like that hold three, four, even up to five real nice bass all hanging out there together. It's not always a one and done. I mean, you want to work every little crevice, the back of the tree, the front of the tree, the side of the tree, there's one right there. Easy release. Again with Dale. Uh, as you saw in the footage, we were out fishing the other day. It was cloudy, those clouds got heavier, suddenly rain. We got soaked <laughs> like Very lots wet. of rain and had to cut our filming short, but we did manage to catch some good fish. Uh, you saw Dale caught a few of those you know, pretty nice two and a half, three pound uh, largemouth there. So, I really appreciate Dale doing that with me and showing us how to do that and describing the technique and everything. We got Dale to stop in this morning for a brief moment here because we want to know a little bit more about Dale and how you guys can find his podcast and if you want to hire Dale as a guide, how to get a hold of him. So Dale, tell us a little bit. Full Scale Outdoors podcast found on every podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, all of it, Spotify, big ones. It's everywhere you find it. If you search it, it should come up. Full Scale is one word and then every social media page you can think of on uh, Facebook. Full scale on uh, outdoors on Facebook and Instagram, uh, TikTok. <laughs> even on TikTok. Even on TikTok. <laughs> Not just for the kids anymore. Okay, so um, full scale outdoors. Yeah, pretty much anywhere. How many podcasts do you have out there now? I imagine towards, I think I just uploaded 289. Okay, so almost 300. So if you're into fishing, or hunting, because I know you do a lot of bird hunting. Yep, a lot of waterfowl hunting. A lot of waterfowl hunting. Ice fishing. Dale's really big at ice fishermen. So got a lot of stuff on podcasts there. Talk about techniques, places to go. Uh, I happen to have been invited to be a guest twice on this podcast. We had a lot of fun. Talk about fishing. It's hard getting you a block of time. <laughs> I know. We're Resort not ownership. Fishing broken water yeah. lines and stuff. Hey, hey, not on camera. We don't, we don't have any problems. <laughs> um, so yeah, we, you know, down there, I've been on with him. We talked freshwater fishing, saltwater fishing, all sorts of things. It's a great show, a lot of fun. So look them up, full scale outdoors. So thanks, Dale. Appreciate you your bet. time. I lost him. <laughs>